Yeah, so I grew up in the Middle East. Uh, I studied medicine. When I was 18 years old, the Lord called me to ministry, but he said, you have 10 years of preparation before I release you to full-time ministry. And uh, that was in 95, July 24th of 95. And in the meantime, I was studying medicine and I graduated. I was uh, working for a couple years. And then July 24th, exactly 10 years to the day, 2005, I got my visa to come to the U.S. and serve in an international ministry. And that's where the Lord started to speak to me that you're no longer a doctor, you're an intercessor, you're somebody who's going to build a bridge between uh, America and the Middle East, and this is how you're going to build my kingdom. Uh, in that time, I was wrestling. In the first six months of, of me being in that internship with this ministry, I started asking the Lord, what is your purpose for my life? Um, you know, I was a medical doctor, but at the same time feeling called to the nations, and wanting to understand how it's all going to work, like financially, like this is, you know, kind of a crazy idea. Uh, and I was praying, I remember one night I was praying all night long. I was part of a, a prayer room. All night long I was praying and asking the Lord, like, what is your purpose for my life? What is your purpose for my life? And this just wrestling over that question for hours. And then... A uh, brother came up to the microphone and started praying, and he said, I want to pray for Israel, but I want to explain why I want to pray for Israel. He said, God's purpose is Israel. God's purpose is salvation of Israel. And as soon as he said that, it was like an arrow that struck my heart, and the Lord said, this is my purpose for your life. Because I've been asking him all night long, what is your purpose? He said, my purpose is Israel's salvation. And you're part of that. I did not understand that. I didn't like it, to be honest, at the time. Uh, but I knew it was the Lord. And I knew in my spirit was awakened to a new understanding of God and a new understanding of the kingdom. Uh, but it took a while for my spirit to catch up, for my mind to catch up with my spirit. So that took me on a journey of trying to understand through scripture, what does that mean? And uh, as a result of that, the, the book, you know, the book came about, which is, I have some in the back here uh, for you guys. So the, it's called Israel, Born in Egypt, Raised in Iran, Rediscovering Ancient Roots. So the Lord, in, in the process of me trying to understand his purpose for Israel, he started to take me on this journey of understanding his heart as a father. He's the God of the nations. He, is, he wants all nations, but he positioned specifically two nations in Scripture to be a blessing to Israel and to be a resource and to be the two nations that actually uh, caused Israel to, to find her identity and destiny in the Lord. And these are the nation of Egypt and Iran, Persia. And when you look at the history of the Old Testament storyline, the, the nation of Israel starts in Egypt. And then after the exile under the Persian Empire, they are released to go back to the promised land. And, and they are restored. And the, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament, ends under the Persian kings. You know, Darius, you know, Esther, Nehemiah, Malachi, Ezra. All these were sent by the Persian kings to rebuild Israel, to establish the, the, the nation again. So the Lord started to show me that these two nations are very important, very significant, in, not just in the past, but also now and in the future of, of the salvation of the Jewish people and Israel as a nation. Um, when you look at the scriptures, like I said, the Old Testament bookends is from a storyline between Egypt and Iran. When you see Israel, the identity of the nation of Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests, a nation of worship. The first tabernacle was established out of Egypt using Egyptian resources. If you remember, the, the people of Israel came out of Egypt you know, at the time of Moses, and the Egyptian neighbors... Many of them left with them because they believed in the God of Abraham. But those who stayed said, go, go, go. And then they gave them articles of gold and silver and clothing. And I believe these were the art that all the gold that they had with them in the desert is what they used 
to build eventually the, the Ark of the Covenant. So it was built through Egyptian gold. And when you see the old, in the time of Cyrus, the Persian king Cyrus, he was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45. He prophesied about this man almost 200 years before his actual birth. Cyrus, my anointed, you will rebuild the foundation of Jerusalem, build the foundation of the temple. 200 years later, Daniel comes, he starts praying, he understands from scripture that it's the 70 years have been fulfilled, and then he prays, and Cyrus, it says in Ezra 1, that the Lord stirs up the heart of King Cyrus, and he issues this decree to cause the Jewish people to go back, and not only that, but to fund the very building of the temple in Israel. So you see these two nations, Egypt and Iran, were very important in the identity to support God's purpose for the nation of Israel as a nation of worship. And I believe this destiny still exists. And you can see how, like in Iran today, it's the only nation in the world that is governed by clergy. And I believe because that speaks of the destiny of the nation as a nation of worship. This is their inheritance to be a nation of worship. And even when the Magi, you know, at the time of Jesus, they came from the east. Many believe they were Persian Jews that lived in Persia, did not return with, with the exile. And at that time, they, you know, they brought the gifts to Jesus. They brought the, the gold, the frankincense and the myrrh. And from that, that gold, the family of Jesus took that gold and went to Egypt. So that gold, the Persian gold, was given to Jesus and his family. And that was the very gold that supported him and his family in Egypt as a refugee. So again, in the storyline of the redemption, you can see how these two nations are so important. And not only these two nations, but all the nations in between. Isaiah 19 talks about there will be a highway of worship between Egypt and Assyria. And Israel, in the midst of these three nations, there will be a blessing in the midst of the land when these, all these nations of the Middle East come together in worship. It would release revival in the nations. So, so this is like the big picture. You know, when we know the end of the story, it removes the tension, right? Like when you're watching a movie, and, you know, when you watch a, a new movie, you don't want anybody to tell you the end of the story, right? Because you want to experience the feelings, the emotions, the, the, all the different dynamics that you want to experience. But when you know the end of the story, it removes the tension. And we know the end of the story, right? Jesus is coming back. And he will reign and rule from Jerusalem. So, so that removes the tension, removes the fear that we may feel sometimes because of the unknown and all the things that are happening around us right now. But it's, it's towards a glorious end. So I want to begin by just uh, read a passage from Psalm 2. And my heart today is to just talk a little bit about God's heart for the Middle East as a nation and to understand that the big picture, because when we understand his heart, it aligns us with his heart, with who he is, and aligns us in prayer. Because we can only, our authority in prayer comes from his word, comes from, from his ways. We can't just pray our own things, but the authority that we have in prayer is rooted and founded in his word and his ways and his will. So the more we align our hearts with what he believes is true, what is true, the more we can have authority in prayer and bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So Psalm chapter 2, I believe it's very familiar uh, with you, but I'll just read it and I'll stop in a couple of passages here. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers 
conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. And again, he laughs. Why? Because he knows the end of the story. You know, he sits in heaven, he laughs. He's not moved, he's not shaken. He's coming back. He will establish his kingdom. All the nations will bow down to him. And he will reign, as he says he is. He, the one enthroned in heaven, laughs. The Lord ridicules them. He speaks to them in his anger, terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will declare the decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possessions. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. So now, kings be wise. Receive instructions, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you will perish in your ways. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are blessed. Our story has a happy ending, right? The king is coming back. I love that it says, I have installed, I have put my king, my holy hill, Zion. I have installed my king on my holy hill, Zion. When I first saw this, I was like, wow, like, it's his hill. <laughs> this is the king's hill. Jerusalem is the Lord's. This is, it's not the Arabs, it's not the Jews, Jewish people, although God gave it to his people, but like ultimately it's his hill. This is where he was born. I remember the first time I, uh, I went to visit the land, uh, the Lord, I felt in my, in my spirit, said, he, the Lord spoke to me, he said, welcome to my home. I want to share my story with you. And that really connected me with his humanity with his who he is he this is where he was born where he grew up where he died where he was resurrected where he ascended and where he's coming back to reign and rule it's that's why there is this fight right now it's not about it's th this is our land or their land it's the spirit it's a spiritual battle that wants to prevent him from coming back he said two things, and we see these two things in this psalm. Jesus said two main markers. Of course, he said before the end of the age, there's going to be so many things that happen, but two main things in Matthew 23 and 24. Jesus said to this, to the Jewish people of the day, he said, you will not see me again, Matthew, 3, Matthew 23, 39. You will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, when you see me, we, you will declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the other thing Jesus said will happen, must happen, he said that, Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So these two factors are so important to happen before the coming of the Lord. And that's why you see this assault against Jerusalem, assault against Israel. Again, it's not about, we're not talking politics. You, everybody can have their own opinion. We're, not, we're gonna fight forever. But the spiritual battle is real, and this, the battle is against his return. Because if he comes back, it's the end of the story for the enemy in the kingdom of darkness. And we know the end of the story, that's why he laughs. And it's going to end too, and he will establish his kingdom. So I love this psalm because it it is a messianic psalm. It is about the end, uh, end times. It says, I will declare the decree. You are my son. I have become your father. Ask me and I will give you the nations and, as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. So these two factors that Jesus talks about in Matthew 23 and 24 are in this psalm. The nations will bow down and Zion will be his holy hill. So, but to understand the end of the story, I want us to come, kind of go back to the beginning of the story. Because we, to understand 
how we get there, you ne we need to understand the initial design in God's heart. Because that will give us hope. Because there is a blueprint, there is a, a map that God has established from the very beginning that is leading to this, this very end. When you look at the storyline of Abraham, we know the story, I don't need to go into it. A lot of details, but Abraham had three wives. His first wife, Sarah. His second wife was Hagar. His third wife was Getur. His first son was Ishmael from Hagar. Second son was Isaac. And then from Getur, he had six other sons. One of them, his name was Midian. So I want to highlight that name for now, and then we'll, we'll find out later why. Now, we know the story in Genesis 17, and Sarah was not uh, able to have children. She said, okay, go to Hagar, and Hagar was Egyptian, and he brought, Abraham brought her from Egypt when he uh, you know, went there in the first time, and he, you know, she became a, a ser servant to Sarah. And when she, Sarah was not having any children, Sarah said, okay, you go mar marry her I'll, and give me a child from, from her. So Abraham agreed, and he did. The first thing I want to mention, highlight, is that it was God that closed Sarah's womb. You know, God is the one who opens wombs and closes wombs. In fact, the three generations of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob... Their wives were barren, and it was God that opened the, their wombs at the right time. Sarah had Isaac after 90 years. Then Isaac's wife had, uh, my brain is going blank, Esau, Esau and Jacob, thank you. And then Jacob's wife, Rachel, you know her, she had uh, Benjamin and uh, Joseph. But God is in control of the womb and he's in control of timing of his, his storyline. And that's why he opens and closes wombs in, in time. So God intentionally closed Sarah's womb. And I'm going to give you the punchline now and then I'll go back. The punchline is Ishmael was desired by God. And the bloodline of Ishmael was desired by God for a very specific reason that I'm going to say later. So Hagar is pregnant and Sarah gets jealous. We read about this in Genesis 16 and 17. So she persecutes her, so Hagar flees. So now she's a lonely woman pregnant with Ishmael and she's in the desert. And then the angel of the Lord, it says in Genesis 17, the angel of the Lord found her. I love that verse. I, one of the, my favorite in all the Bible. The angel of the Lord found her. He was looking for her. He found her to save her. Who is the angel of the Lord? Yeshua, Yeshua the pre-incarnate Christ. He appeared for the first time, by the way. This is the first time this term, the angel of the Lord, is, uh, is mentioned in the Bible. And it is his appearance to an Egyptian woman that was carrying in her womb the seed of Ishmael. Now, if this wasn't desired, God could have easily like, let them go. But Jesus himself comes and saves him, he blesses him, says, go back to Sarah, submit to her, and I will bless him, and his name shall be Ishmael, because I am the God who hears. And in this moment, Hagar had revelation, wow, you are the God who sees me. You are Lahai Roy. She gave God a name. She was the first woman's first person in scripture to name God, to give him a name. That was how... Uh, Powerful that encounter was with Jesus to this Egyptian woman carrying Ishmael. Ishmael was blessed by Jesus himself. And the reason was because the survival of Ishmael was so important in the big storyline 
and, and related to the survival of the Jewish people themselves and the birth of Christ in the fullness of time. And I'm going to explain that in a second. So now it's 13 years later, Sarah uh, still unable to have children, uh, Ishmael is 13 years old, and God appears to Abraham and gives him the covenant of circumcision. And the Bible says that in the same day, Abraham and Ishmael were circumcised together. Now this is only one year before the birth of Isaac. Now God waited 99 years old, 99 years in the life of Abraham to give him the circumcision covenant. He could have waited just one more year for the birth of Isaac and give that circumcision covenant to make Isaac the, the primary receiver of that covenant. But no, God chose to bring Ishmael into that covenant into the blessing of the covenant. He is part of the family. He is important in this storyline for the big picture of the redemption of, of the entire, entire world. So God intentionally chose to bring Ishmael into the blessing of the family. When we think of Ishmael today, the Arab nations, all that, like, okay, these are the, the outcasts. These are the enemies of of Israel and we'll understand why but God brought Ishmael into the covenant so now Isaac is born Abraham and Sarah have a big party and then Sarah doesn't like uh, Ishmael anymore he says to Abraham let the the spawn servant woman and her son to leave. Now this was her son for 13 years. It was obviously Abraham's son for all this time. But now all of a sudden this shift and God tells Abraham, again it was God that told Abraham, listen to your wife. So Abraham, can you imagine you're 14 years old and you are the only heir in your family up until that point. And you have everything. Your father loves you. Your family loves you. You have everything. And one day, you wake up. You know, you're going to have cereal for breakfast. <laughs> it's like, sorry, today there's no cereal. There's no matzah. There's no nothing. You know, you got just a piece of bread and a jug of water. Ciao. Bye. Just go find your way into the desert. Of course, it was so painful for Abraham. You know, he was tested twice, by the way, to let go of his sons. You know, we know we're familiar with the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. But this was prior. He, he believed this was his son. He, he, he did not. He believed God was going to give him Isaac. But, you know, you never know how it's going to end up with God. So he was in pain over this decision. He had to trust God with letting go of, of Ishmael. But from Ishmael's standpoint, I believe that he did, of course, he did not understand why are you doing this, what's going on, and the amount of pain and betrayal and the amount of woundedness that would have entered into his soul that day, I can't imagine how deep that was. And I believe that this became one of the primary spiritual wounds that centuries later ended up in, you know, he had an orphan spirit that centuries later ended up in the, you know, when Islam came about and the, this whole nation came about, the first part, the main decree in Islam is God is one, he has no son, he cannot be born, and cannot have birth. So this is the, 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 the foundation of the Islamic creed is totally against the Father of, of God and the Sonship of Christ. And I believe that the spiritual wound came into, into Ishmael's heart that day that led to centuries later to this whole billions of people that carry that woundedness today. 
the orphan heart. God is so far, he's so distant, you have to do all these things to maybe please him, to maybe gain his favor. And what all they need is to belong to the family, to come back to the family, to be in included in the family. In fact, when Hagar was running away that day, uh, you know, no water, no food. It says that she found a shade under the, under the tree and then she was just waiting for the child to die. And she cried out. And the Lord again found her. The Lord spoke to her. Why are you crying? And he said, I will make him a great nation. And he, it says that the Lord opened her eye to see a well. Now, when you study this passage in Genesis 25, it's, she was running into, in the desert of Beersheba. Why is that significant? Because she found a well in this area of Beersheba. When you look at that scripture, there was, you realize that the well of Beersheba was actually dug by Abraham. There was a story of, you know, the conflict between Abraham's servants and Abimelech's servants, and then they, you know, they negotiated and they solved the problem and they killed seven lambs and says that's why it's called Beersheba. So God in his sovereignty, though Ishmael was let go of, he provided for him water from the well that Abraham, his father, had dug. Amen. And I believe that this is uh, the sovereignty of God to be, to be involved in the salvation, in the storyline. You see all these steps along the way to that make you believe that God is so involved and he cares yes. about this son, this one son, Ishmael. Yes. And well, later on, when you see that, well, jump many generations now, like Jacob, he has his sons, and then his sons are jealous of Joseph. Joseph is in a well, is in a pit, and he's going to be killed. But then Judah says, no, let's, instead of killing him, let's sell him to this group that we're coming down. Now, the Bible is clear to identify this group as the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. So the Bible uses these two names interchangeably, the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. So now, who are the Ishmaelites? The sons of Ishmael. Who are the Midianites? The sons of Midian. Who is Ishmael? Abraham's son. Who is Midian? Abraham's son. So a few centuries later, not centuries, decades later, these groups came down carrying Joseph into his destiny in Egypt. Now, it was his distant cousins that brought him to Egypt. It was Ishmael's descendants, it was Midian's descendants that brought him to Egypt. Again, it's in the sovereignty of God, he preserved Ishmael so that years later, Ishmael would be the very vehicle to bring Joseph into his destiny in Egypt. And Joseph's destiny in Egypt and his survival was so important for the survival of Jacob and his family yes. and, the re and the birthing of the whole nation of, of Israel. And in Romans chapter 11, we know Paul talks about all Israel will be saved. Yeah. How will Israel be saved? W through the provocation of the Gentile nations. Of course, there are Jews everywhere in the world and they will be provoked by everywhere in the world. But Israel as a nation sits in the middle of all these Ishmaelite nations. All these sons of Ishmael. And how will they come to the Lord? They will come when they are provoked by these sons of Ishmael. In Egypt, in Iran, in Turkey, in Gaza. You know, in Gaza there are Christians. There's, there's groups that are still there. There are brothers and sisters in Gaza right now that are, they love the Lord just like we do. So, so the provocation will happen through the, these, these surrounding nations. So now, 
when Ishmael brought Joseph into his destiny in Egypt, Judah was actually the one that, you know, changed the plan, or not changed the plan, like he convinced his brothers, instead of killing him, let's just sell him. So now Judah, not knowing, but in this one act, by selling him to his, their brother, Ishmael, he was preserving his own lineage. And out of Judah, the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Messiah comes out of the line of Judah. And in Egypt, uh, Jacob, on his deathbed, he prophesies about Judah. Out of Judah, a scepter will come. Out of Judah, the obedience of all the nations will be to him. So we see that Egypt as a nation was so important in the, in the preserving of God's plan for the entire world, of preserving the Messiah. And again, we, after the birth of Jesus, where does he go to find refuge? He comes to Egypt. So I'm highlighting all that to say that there is a bigger storyline. Sometimes we... We get focused on this or that and just get kind of distracted or confused by, by politics or our own sentiment and our own presupposed ideas. But there is a plan in God's heart and he wants us to come into that plan so we have a, a agreement and alignment. You know, when I was, uh, I loved what you did with your uh, grandson with the hoopah. Uh, I remember in the process when God was like dealing with my heart concerning Israel, like I said, there's barriers. Anybody in the Middle East, growing up in the Middle East, there's a lot of barriers, you know, in our hearts to love and bless, just politically, socially, sometimes theologically, and history and all of that. So when God was calling me to start praying for Israel and blessing the nation, I just had offense in my heart that I didn't realize I had, but then he started to uh, deal with my heart. I remember... Uh, one, one of the first times I was in a meeting like this and, um, you know, we had a group of Arabs were sitting in the back and then the Messianic group said, okay, we want to bless the Arabs in the room and we want you to come under the hoopah, uh, come in the front. And I was like, I'm not going, thank you, but no, <laughs> I don't like this stuff and I just, nah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But, you know, I just felt the Holy Spirit like, in, you know, push that button, you know, it's persisting. And I'm like wrestling. I'm just sitting in the back there and just, no, nah, I'm not going. I don't like this. I just receive in my seat. I just, I don't like showy stuff. And, uh, so, eventually, of course, the Holy Spirit wins. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm just grinding my teeth, and I'm just going <laughs> to go stand there. And I'm just close my eyes. Okay, I'm just get, this, get me out of here you know, as soon as possible. <laughs> and I remember as soon as I stood under the hoopah, the Holy Spirit said, Welcome to the family of Abraham. He said, You have come under the shelter of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I, of course, like, I just started crying. And I knew the Lord was saying, like, you're part of a bigger family. My Christian faith was rooted in the faith of Abraham. You know, as a Christian, we're grafted in to that, to that tree. And that's why, you know, just to highlight in, this, in the book, uh, this is an a, a olive tree with three branches. And there is, you know, I, this is kind of to express that it's, you know, one root, but then it's the Egypt, Israel, and Iran. It's just the same, same tree in God's heart to have us all be grafted in. So I knew the Lord was, was healing my heart. And I'm sharing this personally to say, to help you understand the, the, the heart and the mindset of many people in the Middle East. So as you pray, you know, there is many ways to pray. The first one is to pray for, you know, the healing of the hearts, the, the, spirit, the orphan spirit, you know, that the spirit of adoption would be revealed to them, that they, people need to belong to 
the family. They, they need to be part of, of the family. And we know, and we've seen that in so many people in the Muslim world today. I mean, many I know personally that once they come to the Lord, they love Israel. They're praying for Israel. And I tell them, like, who, who taught you this? How do you, where did you learn this? And they're like, well, it's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's like, oh, yeah, it's in the Bible. But I grew up in a Christian context that, you know, had different theology. Um, but it's just the spirit of revelation that heals the heart. The spirit of adoption that connects us to Abba's heart. And from there, we, we are able to, to be free and be able to uh, bless what he blesses. So just to highlight one last thing. So after 400 years in Egypt, Moses is called to go and deliver his people. When he flees from Egypt after he kills the Egyptian, he runs away and finds himself in where? Midian. Marrying the, the daughter of the priest of Midian. Again, like he finds himself in the family of Abraham. And in that place, God speaks to him. He appears to him in the burning bush, which is in Midian. By the way, it's in Saudi Arabia. Mount Sinai, it's commonly known that it's in Egypt, but actually it's not. It's in, I believe it's in Saudi. I went to visit. They have the sites there. It's incredible. Uh, just everything is there. The, the rock, that split rock, the mountain top that is black, and the, 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 the palm trees. I mean, it's really, really convincing to, to that this is. They have actually the well. Jethro's well is still there in all this place. So, so God in this area of Saudi Arabia encounters Moses. And he tells them, the sign that I'm talking to you is that you will come back, you will go to Egypt, deliver the people, and come back and worship me on this mountain. This, so he brings the people out to the land of Midian, to the land of the family, and he establishes the tabernacle of worship that was built by Egyptian gold. Now it's in, erected in this land of Midian in Saudi Arabia, and they're worshiping the Lord. And this is where the law was given, right? On Mount Sinai in Arabia. Paul talks about this. Galatians 1 and 2, 3, and 4. He says, Mount Sinai in Arabia. When Paul met the Lord in Damascus, in Galatians, he says that I did not consult with anybody. I went to Arabia, and in Arabia, he met the Lord, and he said, nobody taught me the gospel. No flesh and blood taught me the gospel. It was Jesus Christ himself. So Paul, I believe, in search of, searching to understand the true meaning of the law, he went to the place in Arabia where the law was actually given. He was a student of the law. He knew all the law. And he went to that place where the law was given. And in that place, Jesus comes and explains to him and, and allows him to write like half or so of the New Testament, many of the content of the New Testament, that, was, that revelation that was given to him there. It's so interesting to me that, you know, six centuries later, you have the, the, the new religion that comes out and again, it comes out of that same land in that same area. So there's such an interesting connection between, between uh, in that there's a place of revelation in this very land. So I want to end with this. You know, in my journey, there was offenses in my heart. There was presupposed ideas and different things that I had to overcome. And the Lord confronted me with the passage in Joshua chapter 5, where when the angel of the Lord came to Joshua, Joshua asked him, 
you know, he was going to fight, make a war. Joshua asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you on this side or that side? Are you with them or with us? And the angel of the Lord says, no. I am the commander of the Lord's army. Amen. In other words, the question is, are you on my side? I am the commander here. Yes. You don't tell me which side I'm on. Are you on my side? Are you aligned with my heart? Are you aligned with my ways, with my thoughts that are beyond understanding? Are you seeking to be aligned with truth? Or you want to bring me into your ideas or want me to agree with your presupposed ideas? Now, I want to end with this. We are all needing to be aligned with God, aligned with the Holy Spirit. There are areas in our hearts that are, have been influenced by the world, by media, by politics, by all kinds of things. Not just in the Jewish Arab situation, anything. We need to come back to the place of alignment with the Holy Spirit. Because like I said in the beginning, aligning with His Word, with His ways, is the only way to give us true authority in the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Thank you.